If you're a teacher, a coach, a learning facilitator, an instructional designer, or anything like that, you might want to learn about Ganye's nine events. And guess what? You're in luck. That's exactly what we're going to discuss in this video. My name is Olumide Adele, and it's good to have you on my channel. Don't forget to click on the subscribe button so that you can have access to more of my content. Don't forget to leave a like, leave a comment so that you can help me push the content and it will go really far. Like I said earlier, we're going to learn about Ganye's nine events today. And I find it to be a very interesting topic because it helps with planning um, instructional design. And I think it's a really important one. So what really is Gagne's nine events of instruction? Well, uh, let me start by saying that it is something that was developed by somebody named Gagne, of course, you must have guessed that. And it is backed by research. I would like to tell you a little about Gagne. So I looked for him on Wikipedia and I found this about him. Robert Mills Gagne, uh, who was born in 1916 and died in 2002, was an American educational psychologist best known for his conditions of learning. He pioneered the science of instruction during World War II when he worked with the Army Air Corps uh, training pilots. And it goes on and on and on, talks about him uh, having what he believed to be good instruction. So one of his works, the one that is our concern right now, was actually known as the Conditions of Learning and Theory of Instruction. So now we know that Gagne was an educator and a researcher, and he was concerned with creating a guide that could help instructional designers such as myself and educators and teachers to be able to plan immersive learning experiences. And with the nine events, you can create learning experiences that are effective and efficient. So let's go right into what those nine events are. Number one, gain your learner's attention. So in public speaking, there is a statement that if you lose your audience in the first minute, you've lost them for that speech. And I believe that it is also true for learning. If you lose your class right from the first minute, then you've lost that class. It is really important that you start with the class on a note that gains attention. So what can you do? There are a number of things. You can crack a joke. You can share a story, maybe a deep story. You can even just do something that captures everybody's attention. It can be something funny, can be something dramatic, but whatever it is, make sure that you gain their attention from the start. I think that something that is also useful here, and I'm, I'm bringing this from a background of public speaking, is to know how to use the right tone of voice. Okay, so when you want to capture attention, I can remember when we were in school, when we were in the university, one of the ways that we grabbed attention was to shout at everybody and say, greatest Nigerian students, and everybody would shout, great. You see, for that one minute, everyone would pay attention to you and they would listen to whatever it was that you had to say. I think that it's the same thing with instructional design. You need to find ways of grabbing attention from the beginning. And what you would see is that this takes a bit of planning. You need to actually think through and have a good idea of how you're going to catch attention from the start. Number two is to inform the learners of the objectives. And you see right here, I have a tip for you. The objectives do not have to be boring. I've seen lectures that were prepared and by the time the professor is reading out the objectives, you're almost falling asleep. 
You see, you don't have to go through every single thing and then read all the sub notes and put it out in that boring way. Basically, people just want to know what the end point is. What are you trying to accomplish with that class? Put it in simple language, put it in language that your audience will understand and that they will relate with and might even help them to be excited about what they are going to learn. If you do this, they might understand how that information is going to benefit them. And when they do, they are likely to follow the class better. So you can create a slide that has the objectives. You can tell what the audience will learn. And you can also discuss the goals and outcomes of the learning experience. But don't forget, make sure that you do not allow it to become a boring experience okay the third one is to stimulate recall of prior learning you see when i was in secondary school in in agriculture classes we learned about the process of grafting and essentially um, it was a two-part process in which you would have an existing um, plant uh, which would be known as the lower stock. And then you would add um, a branch coming from somewhere else to it. So you would kind of like bind them together. You would add the sion to the stock. And eventually they would grow together as one plant. Very interesting process. You see, that process of grafting is, I think, very similar to what happens in learning. People have existing knowledge. They've been building from somewhere, maybe from previous classes, maybe from previous experiences. But then you're bringing in something new. But the thing is that it is not completely new. It has to find the relevant um, stock in the existing knowledge. And when it finds that relevant stock, then you can graft those two things together and the learner can learn very well. That is exactly what you're trying to do in this third part of Gaia's nine events. You're trying to find the existing things that the learner already knows such that it can stimulate, it can recall the prior learning, and then it can add what you're about to teach to that. And eventually it's going to give a much better learning experience. And that learner is likely to remember better because it is tied to something that he already knew. So how can you do that? Some of the methods are you can conduct quizzes. You can ask questions from the last lesson. You know, a, a lot of teachers do that. They just um, go over the last lesson and then they ask questions. So you can revise, you can ask questions, you can post questions. So if you're doing it online, if it is e-learning, you can post questions maybe on, on a discussion forum. Um, you can send questions via email and you can have tests ahead of the class so that everybody is forced to remember what they did previously and in some way also prepare for what they're about to do next. Step four of Gagne's learning events is to present the learning content. And this is essentially where the teaching takes place. So in this step, what do you do? You teach. Now, uh, depending on the mode of teaching, this might take place um, you know, in different ways. So if, for example, you're making use of e-learning, of asynchronous e-learning, where um, learners just watch recorded content, you might want to break it down into small chunks so that it is easy for learners to follow and to digest each point. Um, if it is going to be synchronous, meaning that it's happening live, or it's even happening in the physical classroom, um, you might want to make it a little longer than the asynchronous option, but at the same time, you still need to plan that class. You see, one of the things that I've seen with a lot of teachers is that they are not effective because they don't plan their classes. They don't think through the classes. They don't think about the examples they're going to use. They don't think about how they're going to make it a better learning experience for their students. And the implication of that is that oftentimes it turns out to be boring. The student is not really gaining the maximum benefit from the class and all of that. So you want to really think through the learning. It's a very important step. 
But if you think through it and you think like your students, you try to put yourself in the shoes of the students, you might find out that you're able to design good teaching that is going to be very effective. And number five is to provide guidance for learning. You see, oftentimes people are hindered from learning, not because there's a problem with the knowledge itself or even the teaching itself, but because every other thing around it is cumbersome or complicated or not straightforward. So you want to make sure that the things surrounding your learning are as easy to use as possible and that your learner can understand them very well. So you want to look at elements like your UI. If, you're, um, if it is e-learning, you want to look at things like your user interface. Is it friendly? Is it um, intuitive? Can, can learners just look at it and know what next to do, what to click on, how to access the question, how to access your guides? Do they have all those things and are those things handy? So you want to make sure that you guide your learners as best as possible. For me, uh, one of the, the LMS systems, learning management systems that I use is Moodle. And I like Moodle because it has a number of features that are simply great. However, I have also found that Moodle is not in itself um, intuitive. Um, I found that depending on the audience that I want to teach, um, other learning management systems, like even those ones powered by WordPress, might be much more intuitive. So if it's not going to be a long-term class for me, I would prefer to use some of the simpler learning management systems. So that's just an example. As much as possible, you want to make sure that your learners are actually able to learn and they don't have any trouble learning. And that is your responsibility. Number six is elicit performance. And what this is basically about is that you allow your learners to have the opportunity to try out what they've learned. You allow them to practice. There are ways you can do that. You can give them quizzes. You can give them quick exercises. You can even ask them to demonstrate, to role play. But whatever the thing is that you're going to use, make sure that you give them the opportunity to relieve what you've taught um, and, and let them do it on their own. Let them do it such that they are likely to remember. You might pair them, you might um, put them in groups, but make sure that each person is participating and make sure that it is being done in a way that they are likely to be able to do it when they need to do it on their own. And number seven closely follows the sixth one. That is to provide feedback. You see, feedback is extremely important. Learners need to know that they are making progress. The way they will know is that you are providing them feedback. Feedback can also help them such that if they're not going in the right direction, before they go too far away, you can turn them aright. You can steer them in the right direction. So provide feedback and let that feedback be as quick, as immediate as possible possible. There are different types of feedback. There is confirmatory feedback, which essentially helps the students to know that they are following instructions, that they are following the right steps. It doesn't bother about whether the content of what they are doing is correct. It's really just about the steps. It, it tells that they are following the right steps. There is evaluative feedback. Evaluative feedback is about where the student is at the moment, your opinion of uh, the student's current work. It doesn't really deal with how they can improve, but it helps them to know what your assessment of their current work is. There is remedial feedback. Remedial feedback is the kind of feedback you give when a student is going in the wrong direction and you want to point that student to right without actually telling the students what to do. So you design the whole feedback process to um, guide the students to right such that the student ends up discovering it on their own. And there is also descriptive feedback. 
For this one, you're, you're going into details, you're explaining exactly what they need to do, you're explaining the steps that they need to follow and how they can go right. So the main point is feedback, regardless of the type of feedback that you choose, feedback is essential to learning and it should closely follow performance so that the student knows how to proceed. Number eight is assess performance, assess performance. And here Gagne is talking about designing things that force the learner to recall what has been learned. Things in this instance, like an examination. Can you remember when you had to do exams in school? Most likely you would have had to take time to study, to read, to memorize, to rehearse with friends, to study with other people, maybe to even ask questions from the teacher. And you would have done all of those because you knew that you had exams and you did not want to fail. You see, I'm sure that after those exams, you probably were able to remember a lot of the things that you studied um, even years later. That is why um, that particular phase is very important. It's a way of committing things to memory and forcing yourself to keep those things in memory. So such assessments of performance should be designed into learning. And one of the best examples of such is examinations, but it can also be interviews, it can be um, quizzes and things like that. And the last step of Gagne's nine events is enhance retention and transfer. Enhance retention and transfer. And you see, this step is concerned with making sure that the learner is able to transfer the skills learned, the knowledge learned into real world scenarios. So it means that you design the learning with the mindset of how does this apply in the real world? How is it relevant in the workplace? How is it relevant in the world at large? And how can you gradually lead your learner into being able to apply that knowledge, not just in an academic context or in a learning context, but in a real world scenario? So what um, scenarios can you paint? What um, situations can you create that will force the learner to use the learning learned in real world scenarios. Why? Because perhaps that is the ultimate goal of learning. Learning is not just about getting good grades and passing exams and all of that. Learning is about being able to apply the knowledge to real life. So you might want to use examples that are um, going to help to apply that knowledge in real life. You might want to create such scenarios and design your learning to fulfill that ultimate step. So we just discussed Gagne's nine events. I hope it was value for your time. Make sure that you subscribe to this channel to have more of my content. Click on the subscribe button right now. You can also turn on notifications so that you can get to know when I post a new video. I'm currently running a series on instructional design and educational technology. And if you'd like more videos like this one, let me know in the comments. Um, and of course, like I said, subscribe. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in my very next video. Do have a lovely day.